So you're listening to Salva City Radio 94.4 FM with your host, Jimmy Petruzzi, on the Friday Sports Show, bringing you all the news from the local area and around the world. And today we have a really fascinating guest. We bring you guests from the local area and around the world, giving you insights into sport around the world, football, different sports, athletics, track and field. We cover pretty much every sport on this show. We bring you some of the world's best athletes, footballers, sports people, coaches, people affiliated to sport in different disciplines. And recently we've also featured some of the most influential psychologists in, in the world. We've been very fortunate to have spoken to some of the most influential psychologists in the world. And we're going to carry on bringing you uh, them as well. We have a great response from our, our new segment today. We're going to take a, a trip to the British Virgin Islands. We've got a really um, interesting guest today. We're going to have a look at how football is developing in, in the British Virgin Islands. And we've sort of spoken to many guests around the world. And it's quite fascinating to hear um, you know, different stories about how people adapt and, and do their work in different countries. And today we bring you Dan Neville, who's the Technical Director of the British Virgin Islands Football Association. Dan, welcome to the show. Great to have you on board. Yeah, no, great great to be here. Uh, thanks thanks for uh, inviting me on. You know, it's great to have you on board. And our listeners are probably wondering um, what you do in terms of uh, your role can you sort of give us a bit of insight into what your role involves? You're the technical director of the British Virgin Islands. What does that involve, Dan? What do you do? Um, so, uh, for the, the obviously the FA run the football provision on the island. So the um, general secretary would govern things like administration and uh, governance, and then uh, as technical director, I would oversee all of the technical aspects of the football provision which would include which would include which would cover grassroots uh youth uh national teams and age groups uh elite youth uh the women's program and coach education so it's, it's quite um a, a big role you have a lot of responsibility there in the sense that of developing the game there and how how do you think it's gone thus far then what's your experience how would you sort of just for our listeners in you know wondering what it's like to do and be a technical director how would you sort of sum up thus far how things have gone yeah i think things have gone actually very well so far uh we've got a great group of enthusiastic coaches that, that deliver the work that, that we set um very very well we've got a really supportive president and executive committee that that back the technical department and uh juliana lucar general secretary does a fantastic job um managing the governance and administration and you know it's got a wealth of you know, football knowledge and experience to bring with us so um, that, that then allows us to have success on the pitch all of our programs that we've started um, recently so we had talent BVI the, the new academy system has, has gone very well um, we are just starting a coach mentor program now and with our coach education we've just had 12 um, coaches graduate on their D license, which is a, a great achievement to have 12 more fully qualified D license coaches on the island. And then we've been running um, educational webinars every Monday where we've had anything between sort of 40 and 60 people on. Um, then uh, CONCACAF have launched, launched an e learning academy that we've also uh, included myself, had staff attend, which has been very beneficial as well. And then we've got an online strength and conditioning program that we also started during lockdown to ensure that the uh the players keep active so i mean i, I came into the job in january um for my uh, national team assistant coach beforehand so i had a knowledge of the island that yeah in the last yeah sort of you know since january it's it's really kicked on and it's kicked on from the support of everyone not 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 just me yeah, that's no, really interesting and in terms of the demographic just for our listeners what's the sort of um, talent pool. How many? What sort of? How? What's the demographic of, of the island, uh, Dan? In terms of players and, and what sort of? What's what's the sort of uh, player pool for you to sort of choose from? Uh, yeah. So the island has twenty, uh, approximately a twenty-four thousand population. Now, I think um, different sources will give, give different numbers, but that's the approximate population. So. In terms of the players, the talent pool is, you know, considerably smaller than some bigger nations. Um, but we do one advantage you have got if you're a little bit smaller. That as technical director, I actually know every player. So mm -hmm. in our talent BVI program, for instance, I know every player. I know every player in the 
national team age groups, as do the rest of the coaches. So I think that's a really good start. That it's great having a massive talent pool, but if you don't know all of them, mm. or you can't get to all of them, and you know you can't identify them, that that can become a problem. So although our pool is small, um, we've identified quite well, and we know all the players, and we can really oversee their their development at close hand. So it's you know it has pros mm. and cons. I mean, what we think is a positive for us. Yeah, no, absolutely. You've got to turn it into positive. And I think that with your experience, of, of, I mean, I, I sort of spoke to a colleague of mine the other day and we sort of were reflecting on certain clubs who've produced players and probably have punched above their weight, if you, if you want to put it that way. And you've obviously been at Bournemouth. And, and do, you, do you feel that, I mean, Bournemouth's obviously been an established Premier League club for a long time now, which is amazing what they've achieved and continue to achieve. And do you feel that your experience working at the, at the, with the young players over there has, has sort of benefited you in terms of the role at the, the British Virgin Islands there? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so when I worked for Bournemouth, I mean, I was there for around 14 years. I worked as a under-11s academy coach and then under 15, 16 and 18 assistant for uh, six years. Then I went into under-17s, 21, um, talent recruitment, and then I finished up as talent ID uh, program manager um, for, for, the, uh, for the last spell there. So all of those slightly different roles definitely gave me the, you know, the opportunity that when I come to the Virgin Islands, and you know, the experience is necessary to see where players need to go and how the pathway is created. I mean, I worked at Bournemouth when they were in League Two, so you know, budget very tight, a small coaching team. Um, but we had, you know, everyone sort of knew each other. It's a close knit environment, and you know, when we were in sort of League One, League Two, I do see some similarities of where we are with the Virgin Islands now. Now we're very well backed by the executive committee, but our budget against someone, you know, like the USA, for instance, is you know massive difference. Yeah. But we use all of our resources to their maximum potential. Um, because it's that close-knit family atmosphere and everyone pulls together. Um, that feels a bit like it did in Bournemouth, for, you know, uh, when Bournemouth were in League 1 and League 2, and they did produce a lot of players at that point. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I sort of kept an eye on, on, on Bournemouth in the sense that, I mean, at the time uh, when they were in League 2, I was sort of working for Bury and uh, we had a, a lad who was playing for us, Pew, who ended up um, going across to, to you guys there, and... I sort of, you know, kept an eye on on, on them and, and, and so on and so forth. And I, I, I thought one thing that sort of amazed me is that they never really went out there and sort of, you know, um, broke the bank in this. I'm, I'm, don't get me wrong, obviously they invested and in that sort of stuff, but they never sort of went out there and sort of got themselves into sort of that sort of financial difficulty that certain clubs do. Is that something that you guys were mindful of, Dan, to sort of make sure you really, you know, prudent with money and, and, and spend that wisely and make sure young players are yeah. coming through? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, you know, we have to be prudent in everything we do, and we have to make sure that the budget is used to its best potential. Now, when uh, Maxim Demin come into Bournemouth, although that you know their rise from League Two to the Premier League, you know, if you look at the team sheet in the like the first season in the Premier League, they had you know the majority of the team have played in League One, League Two. So you know, Eddie and his coaching staff's ethos of really maximising the ability of every player that you've got. And, taking them with you on the journey is definitely something that you know we, we've tried to do as well and you know you look at like Danny Ings, Sam Vokes, Jaden Stockley, Josh McCoy, those four you know they got chances at first team level because the club at the time didn't have the budget. I mean how far can say the British Virgin Islands go uh, then you know can they sort of I mean obviously Bournemouth got to the Premier League and we've seen teams sort of punch above their weight can, how far can the, the British Virgin Islands go? What, what are your, I know that your aspirations are, uh, you know, you want to go as far as you can, but how far do you realistically see them going? Well, I mean, our ultimate aim, you know, we've just actually written a strategic plan for the next five years that is going to have a digital launch very shortly. But, you know, our, our overall aim is to have a very well-organised football vision on the island to create as many opportunities and differing opportunities for players on the island as possible. But actually, we want to reach the 2026 World Cup. That's our ultimate. That's our ultimate aim. Yeah. Um, and if we're going to do that, then we need to make sure that all of the individual departments and everything that we do is as, is as perfect as it can be. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, our listeners are probably wondering, they're thinking, OK, the 2026 uh, World Cup, uh, you know, it's, it's being hosted in, in three different countries. And, 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 and they're probably thinking, OK, CONCACAF, America, Mexico, the more traditional nations, they've been, some might remember the, the likes of Jamaica getting through to the World Cup. But realistically, there, there is a chance in the sense that do, do the, the host nations get automatic qualification, uh, Dan, the... Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. it's you know it's it's uh, it's almost a perfect storm for us yeah. with planets aligning to actually give us you know the best possible chance. It's the first World Cup where it's going to be hosted across three nations: mm-hmm. Mexico, Mexico, Canada, USA. So they will all, all they're, the big three in our region are all automatically going to get qualification places as hosts, and couple that with FIFA actually extending the World Cup to more teams than they ever have done. You know, I think the CONCACAF region, I believe, has five places, and that excludes the top three. So when, when you wow. look at that, it's a perfect storm. The things that we can't control have gone in our favour. Now we need to ensure that the things we can control are done as well as they possibly can mm-hmm. be so we can take advantage of the chance that we've been given. Absolutely. I mean, that said, no doubt you won't be taking an opposition lightly. I mean, we've, we've seen CONCACAF, we saw in 2014, we were all expecting in, in the England group, you know, who, who was going to finish top, you know, Italy or England, and then Costa Rica through Spain in the work. And that really showed that there is a lot of quality in that region. And, and so, I mean, in terms of yourself, I know that you do your homework and see um, what, what is out there. And what are your thoughts on, on, on the region itself, Dan, just for our listeners who, who probably aren't too familiar with? Um, who, who do you think would be outside, say, the likes of you know America, Canada, Mexico, the teams that um, present the biggest uh, challenge? Yeah, so you've got like Honduras and Guatemala, uh, the Central American countries that are always very strong, and then you've obviously got the the countries with the big populations like Jamaica and Trinidad. Uh, Jamaica, uh, you know, under Fear, Fiddle Whitmore and Wendell Downswell. Uh, you know, they're getting back to their to their best, I would say. So I think they're going to be a real force. Um, they're, they're probably be the ones to be. Um, you know, I think the fact that it is in the CONCACAF region as well, mm. uh, the style of football is different. You know, it's a lot hotter. So I think uh, European countries going out to the CONCACAF region may find it a little bit difficult, whereas, you know, we, we're used to playing in that, same as the other nations, all the time. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, a CONCACAF nation in that World Cup in 2026 will actually do very, very well. Yeah, and absolutely. And I mean, no that surprise you, of you. Yeah, no, for sure. And I mean, no doubt you, you know you want to sort of promote the players that are coming through and and, and the uh, the local players. And but we've seen nations in 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 the past, different nations. Uh, it happens. A lot of a lot of countries, obviously, sometimes that's a you know take an opportunity where maybe players have been grandparents or parents have been born somewhere and, and and they may play for that sort of country. What's the system there? I mean, we, maybe people are listening in thinking, can, can we qualify for maybe playing for the British Virgin Islands? What's the situation there and for anyone sort of... Yeah, so yeah. Um, FIFA CONCACAF statutes state a UK or BVI passport because we're a British dependent territory. Uh, heritage from uh, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather on both sides or uh, to, and, and or two years residency on the island. Um, I mean, it's an interesting one because we've actually got two players at the moment that we would definitely select for national team. But because they were born elsewhere and moved to the island when they were very young, they haven't actually got a BVI or UK passport. So okay. despite living on the island for you know, 17, 18 years, they they're still they still cannot represent us currently. Wow. Um, because of uh, they don't hold that UK passport, um, so that's a real challenge for us because we've got some great players on the island that have lived there nearly all their lives that we can't select. So that's a challenge. Um, so you know the heritage and residency rule. We're always looking to um, try and find players that, that that would qualify through that. We managed to find three or four in the UK, and we found one in the US um, that we that we managed to utilise, but. We are predominantly now, if you look at the Bahamas squad, I would have said we were nearly 70% locally born. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible that in terms of... Uh, Which is great, and we're really yeah. proud of that. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I mean, you'll probably be inundated now, Dan, with emails from, from people asking if they'll qualify for the, uh, for the team. What, I mean, what a great opportunity it would be to play international football. That's, that's amazing. And what about in terms of players playing abroad? I mean, obviously you want to keep the best players there and develop them, but equally in saying that, you know, if you have got a player that can play uh, in Europe, and, and I mean, is that something that you guys are sort of conscious of, perhaps a platform for players yeah, to play? Yeah, I mean, in actual fact... Um so if we go on the Bahamas squad from November, there were only three or four that are actually still living on the island due to Hurricane Irma in 2017. And then traditionally when players get to 14, 15, they tend to either move to the UK or US to further their education. Mm. So we've actually got um, 14 players that, that currently live in the UK and we have five that currently live in America that are all from the island and moved across so we have got you know the predominant uh, predominantly our squad is in UK and Europe at the moment UK Europe and US and that mm-hmm. provides a lot of very very different opportunities and challenges for players so we've definitely seen the players that have gone US mm-hmm. and Europe have really really developed yeah absolutely and you know I think What's quite interesting there is sort of you mentioned the sort of player pool and I mean what are the sort of competing sports then obviously you want the players to play uh, football uh, ideally the most talented I mean we know that the, the Virgin Islands has got some talented athletes there what are some of the other sports that you sort of find football is, is sort of competing against in terms of um, uh, talented athletes sort of turning their attention to yeah so track and field is the obvious one you know track and field is ingrained into our culture um we've just produced uh two medal winning athletes um which is absolutely fantastic for the island uh, for the sport so track and field is always one that players do as well um we actually encourage it we're we're not <clears throat> we're not a federation uh that will try and keep them playing one sport because our general belief is especially sort of sevens to twelves that the more sports players play actually the more they'll Mm. improve physically and then they'll start to specialize on a sport maybe sort of 13 14 so we have a good relationship with the federations and we actively encourage players to play other sports so obviously track and field is a big one but um, basketball and softball as well are quite uh quite regularly played as well Mm. No, that's that's a great point. Obviously, the 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 mechanisms of playing other sports physiologically can transfer well to, to football. I think what's quite interesting in terms of the the, the you know the setup you have there is the aspiration of getting to the the, the World Cup. Let's say 2026, you're at the World Cup. What would it mean to the island then? What would the, what would the legacy be for the for football? Oh, the, the the exposure. Uh, uh, that, that that would generate would be absolutely brilliant in terms of um, putting the island on the map and putting it in front of people, you know, and then the knock-on effect is obviously the tourism and uh, the opportunities that it'll create for, you know, the players leading on from that. And I think it would also inspire another generation of young footballers. Mm. So I think it would have a hugely positive effect on the island if we could get there or somewhere near there. So it'd have a, an amazing knock-on effect too, not just in football, but also implications in, in, in other areas, like you've mentioned, tourism, as and when we, you know, tourism opens up again, that it will do at some point. But So it would have implications as well outside football too, do you feel, Dan, as well as the a social element as well? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, then, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and say in terms of the, 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 the local players, do they have do they sort of do they watch the Premier League? Are they familiar with the the European football themselves or Yeah, that's right, yeah. No, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, on the island you've got a better a better ability to watch Premier League games than you have in the UK. I think um, through the sports channel, it might be Fox, mm. um, you can watch every Premier League game on a Saturday afternoon. Wow. So you know, the access to watch games is uh, is excellent over there, actually better than it is here. So yeah, all, all the players have you know clubs that they follow and players that they like in the uh, UK and, and Europe, and you know it's a it's a really good inspiration. We'd like to get to the point where there's a Caribbean Pro League on the way that you know if we could get quite a few teams entered, that we could get the same sort of interest there, and players were 
were following players closer to home, I mean, that would be a great situation to be in. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And no doubt you, you've got them watching Bournemouth, uh, Dan. That's, that, that might be, you know, the obviously the the, the, um, the, the the fashionable teams in terms of the, you know the, the Chelsea's, the, you know the cities at, at the moment. Obviously, United, Liverpool are known everywhere. Have you sort of um, have you have you have you sort of introduced them to, to Bournemouth? Are they familiar with the, the team themselves? Or yeah, that they are. So we've had quite a few that have travelled over to us and when they've travelled over they've either been on a stadium tour or they've done one of the Bournemouth Academy camps or they've been to watch a game so yeah they're quite uh, yeah they're quite familiar with Bournemouth and we've actually got a few one two three we've actually got five living in, in uh, Bournemouth in the Dorset area at the moment with possibly another couple coming across as well so uh, yeah they're, they're fully aware of who Bournemouth are. You know, that's, a, that's a really important. I mean, that's an important point. I think, and obviously, with your contacts at Bournemouth and with your stature at the club too, I think obviously there there is that sort of potential. If if you have got, say, you know, a rising star, someone showing huge potential, then then would that be something that I mean, I'm not necessarily just saying Bournemouth. It could be any other team, but do you, do you see that as, as a possibility? Would yeah, it, definitely. I mean, in actual fact, one of our under 16s, Luca Charwell, was on trial at Bournemouth last year. Um, Ryan Letson, Zani Callwood are in our under-13s, uh, are in their junior training centre at the moment, which is one below the academy, and Tyler Forbes, our national team player, uh, was due to go on trial in April, but obviously because of COVID he hasn't been able to go in, but we're hopeful that he'll go on trial when, when, all, things are, when all things are back to normal, so mm. yeah, we've had four players already having in, involvement with the club. Um, and yeah, you know, there's a, a lot of talented players, so if not Bournemouth, you know, we're always looking to try and create mm. opportunities for the players to play at the highest level they can, albeit that, you know, UK, Virgin Islands, or the US. Mm, absolutely. I think the interesting thing there is if you can keep the players like a cluster of players together, it always bodes well when you got you see any successful national team that had like three or four or five players all coming through a youth system together and they just sort of know the game really well. and. That, that, that could be yeah, a, a massive positive for sure if, if you know keeping them to, to, together in that in that sense as well I mean no doubt there's there's a lot of clubs in this area that you know probably keep an eye uh, as well and and you know notably um, Salford who's, who's had this sort of rise and albeit they've been backed by the class of 92 yeah. the, the lads so to speak and but I think that one realization is for sure uh, you know Dan is that you know, if there's any questions about how tough League Two would be, um, the realization that it, you know it, it is a golf, and I mean yourself, your, your experience of Bournemouth, just your thoughts. You know, I know it's obviously difficult to sort of comment, and you know it's been you know a while since you sort of uh, you know been, been in the league. But what are your thoughts on maybe Southland in terms of when when football does resume? I mean, what do you think your experience, the expectations could be? I mean, I think. From most people, I think were quite grounded this year. They weren't sort of thinking that they were going to walk through the league. But I think there was a quarter of people thinking, okay, with the investment, that, you know, they'd be running away for it again. And what are some of your thoughts in terms of League Two? How tough is it to sort of get out of the league and start pushing forward? Oh yeah, I mean, League, league Two is a is a tough league because it's a physically good league. Um, you know, the games come thick and fast, you end up playing sort of Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Wednesday mm. most weeks. Obviously, you enter the FA Cup in round one rather than round three. So you need a, you know, a squad capable of managing, you know, a 50-game season. Um, so then, yeah, sports science and strength and conditioning and nutrition, you know, all of those elements then become really important. And then uh, how you utilise your time on the training ground, again, is really important because you're probably only going to train you know, mm. if you play Saturday, you'd be off Sunday, recovery Monday, for a light session ahead of Tuesday. You play Tuesday, recovery Wednesday. Then you'd have a, a you know, a core and key session on Thursday, and then Friday would end up being light again because you could be travelling away and leaving the night before. Mm. So, you know, the management of of your time and the content of the sessions and the rehabilitation process of the players and you know that that's all really important, and you tend to have a smaller staff at League Two as well. So, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it is a tough division to get out of, and then League One doesn't get any easier. And then the Championship again, you've got some very well backed clubs financially, Absolutely. with some great resources, and that becomes difficult. So it's a it's a really uh, 
you know, it's a, you know, to go from League Two to the Premier League is a is an amazing achievement for for anyone anyone to do because it is a you know all four divisions are are really tough. I can't actually think of another league where all of the divisions are quite so competitive. Mm, absolutely, and, and the thing is too, Dan, anyone can beat anyone on a day. I know that sort of applies to football in general, but in League Two, that's paramount. You could be top of the league and team bottom of the league, there's, there's nothing in it. It's just it's so close yeah. and so evenly matched. It's, it's, it's really, really tough, and like the physicality is, is a huge thing. And But, you know, Southwood themselves have done remarkably well, investment or no investment, I think, from where they were, you know, step eight or nine, a few years ago to sort of keep going forward it's been uh, a, a big achievement and, and long may it continue but it's been really interesting speaking to you Dan I'm sure the listeners have been really intrigued you know it's not every day we sort of you know hear uh, you know what goes on in, in, in sort of you know different places I mean British Virgin Islands I think it's, it's an amazing uh, experience for you and uh, we've ever, we'll keep an eye that's for sure hopefully um, you know in 2026 we see you guys lining up in the same group as England, would that be an amazing experience? Do you think, Dan, if, if you're in the same group as, as England and all things being oh, well? Yeah, no, that, 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 I mean, that would be absolutely brilliant. Uh, you know, England would always be a country I'd want to play, obviously, despite yeah. being English. My uh, my allegiances would be firmly with the Virgin Islands that day. Hopefully we could win the group and they, they could finish second. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, all things are possible in football and you just never know. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, back against you guys getting there and we'll certainly keep an eye out and, and, and see how things materialise. But thanks again, Dan, for coming on board the show. It's been great speaking to you. We wish you all the very best on your future endeavours and, and, you know, hopefully get to the uh, 2026. Yeah, no, definitely. And what I would urge, you know, is everyone, you know, make us your, your second team. Absolutely. Obviously, you'd always follow country that, that you were born in, you know, that you originate from. Um, obviously, England's always the team I follow, but I've always followed Brazil as well, because I really like their, the sound of football and, the, you know, the manner in which it's played. But, you know, as a, as a nation, we love an underdog, and I would love people to get on board with our story and follow our results and follow our progress. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we'd love everyone, you know, Let's make British Virgin Islands your second team. Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know, it's certainly you know, you, got, you guys get there. That'd be um, a lot of countries would sort of keep an eye out and think, what an amazing experience. I suppose in one sense, Dan, it's a bit like say, on a, on a completely different scale, but when when Iceland had their run um, at the Euros, and and it was just uh, obviously a much smaller population size to, than than a lot of the other European countries. But it just goes to show when you manage a set of players really well and get the best out of them. Then, then anything is possible, really, and um, in, in, in that's, that's you know one of the things in football. I mean, that's the, the beauty of football, why we love the game, is that it, it continues to sort of you know throw these sort of fairy tale, uh, amazing stories. But uh, thanks again, Dan, for joining us on the Southwood City Radio ninety four point four FM Friday Sports Show. It's been uh, really speaking to you, and wish you all the very best. Yeah, oh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me on. Thank you again. Thanks, Dan. That was Dan Neville, the technical director of the Beauty First Islands Football Association, giving you an insight, incredible insight into his work out there, and we wish him all the best, and the British Virgin Islands all the best too, and we'll certainly keep an eye out to see how their progress unfolds, and we've every confidence that, you know, from, that it will get to where they want to get to, and, and who knows, it may be a possibility. You're listening to South City Radio 94.4 FM, the Friday Sports Show of your host, Timmy Petruzzi, bringing you all the news from the local area and around the world. Today's show, we have a very uh, interesting guest uh, who's going to join us from across the other side of the world. We uh, interview people from all around the world. We're very fortunate to interview some of the world's best athletes, sports people, coaches, trainers. We've got a recent segment that we interview some of the world's leading, almost influential psychologists too have been kind enough to come on the show and talk about the world of psychology. Um, today we're going to sort of focus on the sport, rugby league. Uh, rugby league is really popular in this area. The this recent success of Salford uh, last season, um, they had a phenomenal season. This season, well up until obviously, um, you know, COVID, things probably weren't going as well as they would have liked them to have been going, but all that's said and done, you know, we'll see what happens as and when it resumes. And so today's guest has played in the UK, and I'm sure he'll give us a fascinating insight in terms of his sort of thoughts on the game over here and the game, obviously, uh, in Australia. So welcome to the show, uh, Ben Crossgate. Great to have you on board. 
Hi Jimmy, thank you for having me. Yeah. Pleasure to be on. Yeah, no, great to have you on board. And, and you know, obviously you've had a uh, you know a great career in the game as a as a as a player and, and a coach as well. Your you latest role, the uh, assistant coach at the Brisbane Broncos. You've also worked in the women's game too, New South Wales Rugby League as well. Yeah. If we sort of start with your playing career, Ben, just for our listeners, some of them will probably uh, you know be aware and, and, and have seen you play, especially our, our South Rugby League fans will sort of no doubt seen you and you know the, the likes of Leeds, Wigan, and and witness. Um, I mean, we'll start with your own career. How do you see the game in terms of the Australian League and, and the league over in the UK? And it's always an interesting sort of insight to see what your thoughts are, having played in both competitions. Yeah, I, I think the the major difference with the NRL and the Super League is every game in the NRL is a pretty big deal. Unfortunately, respective to the Super League, um, yeah. not every game in the Super League is televised uh, on television. That's a big thing that you, you don't, not every game gets the video referee as well. So you do just feel a little bit less of love from the, the rugby league um, community over there or the governing body because unfortunately just not every game gets televised um, and the discrepancies between the top teams and the second tier teams there is a, a bit of a gap um, yeah. where every game in the NRL is quite intense and the bottom team in the competition could more than likely knock off the top team not that it doesn't happen in the Super League but just on a, a more regular occurrence there is a bit more of a discrepancy between uh, the top tier teams and the bottom tier teams and the bottom tier teams are used a bit more of a developing teams for de developing yeah. their talent and they have a lot of talent from the, uh, the higher ranking teams to get loaned out to players to develop them yeah. we don't really have that um, ability in the NRL with the teams to do that, it's just all, all for one and one for all in the NRL with your team, with the Super League some clubs have, have seen possibly more as a development team due yeah. to their budget and top of teams sort of start there because of their um, financial resources that's, the, that's probably the biggest difference where the intensity of the game is week in week out yeah. can vary um, in the Super League compared to uh, the NRL there are some really intense games in the Super League that you don't really get in the NRL with the rivalries. Like, I was part of a Leeds and Bradford rivalry. Yeah. I was a, a part of a Witness Vikings and Warrington rivalry and between Wigan and St Helens. So those cultural mesh rivalries are something that... Um, the Super yeah. League has probably a little bit over than the NRL, and they're terrific games to be a part of. Yeah, and that's really interesting you say, and it'd be interesting to sort of hear your take in, on, in, in terms of the overall uh, level of competition. But we sort of mentioned that obviously state of origin is a big thing in Australia, and uh, I mean, how would you describe the state of origin from a, from the point of view of, of, of the level of intensity um, that's sort of going up a notch? I mean, you mentioned obviously the traditional rivalries between, say, the Wigan and St Helens and the Leeds and the Bradfords of this world, but in terms of the state of origin, I suppose that's probably every uh, young um, sports person aspiration to play in New South Wales and Queensland. Is that sort of going up another level as well, then, would you say? or? Yeah, most definitely. And there's actually a genuine hate for those three games. There's actual genuine hate between the opposition players. And you might even be club teammates week in, week out. But once you put on that blue and that maroon jersey, there's actually a sense of hate towards the opposition. And um, that rivalry just goes to the next level. So the intensity and the height and awareness of how you play. And you'll see players do things in, say, a Rodgers you would never see them do in club footy just because everyone's height and awareness is up and the intensity you're, you're running faster you're hitting harder um, your passes are crisper just because everyone's quality has risen to the level uh, of the mean and it's just a, a rivalry there that's um, pretty much unmatched uh, obviously you've got the Australian and Great Britain tests and Australia and New Zealand but there seems to be something about um when two states collide, that um, uh, the country sort of splits splits in half, at least on the eastern seaboard of Australia, anyway. Yeah, no, that's interesting stuff. And, and in terms of, say, you mentioned International Rugby uh, League, and it, does that sort of filter through, do you think, to international level? Is that possibly why, you know, in, in recent years, you've seen some really close encounters between Australia and, and Great Britain and England, and you kind of think, well, is it sort of belief, and you sort of go back to the World Cup, you know, it's, it's, it's England sort of ran Australia really close in, in, in the semi final, but you think it just seems to be a bit of an edge where there's sort of belief or just that intensity of the game week in, week out. I mean, what are your thoughts at international level, uh, Ben, yourself, in terms of where England is and, and what they could do to maybe, you know, bridge that gap? 
Well, it's a double-edged sword. England are definitely closing the gap on Australia. But closing that gap has been for the sake of this English Super League. A lot of the real good English Super League players have come over to Australia and playing in the NRL week in, week out yeah. now. So that's diluting the competition in the Super League, unfortunately. Uh, whether those players go back home and, and, and take what they've learned in the intensity and um, from the NRL back to the Super League, Hopefully they do, but they're playing more and more of their quality players over here in Australia, which is a terrific thing yeah. for them internationally, but it's not great for them at the grassroots level there in, in the UK. It yeah. is giving opportunities for other players to develop through and come through into Super League where those positions may not be available if those Burgess boys or Williams were yeah. back in and Bateman were back in um, back in the UK, give the other guys an opportunity to come up, but then do they get poached or they come through and become really good superstars in the UK game as well so uh, uh, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't but it's definitely closing the gap for international um, standards between Australia and England because there's more yeah. and more players playing in the premier competition in, in the NRL yeah and they sort of get familiarised I guess with the players too and I suppose in one sense too exactly. and it kind of breaks that aura sometimes you know you kind of you're playing against these players week in week out you think well you know, I've got a chance here. But in terms of your own career, I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, you know, you played for Melbourne, and um, you know, recently um, the game, the Super League's expanded to Toronto. Obviously, you know, England, Toronto, different countries is a long way away. But in one sense, I suppose, when the game went to Melbourne, you kind of think would traditionally it's sort of AFL territory type thing. And how, what was it like playing in Melbourne in terms of the you know playing rugby league in Melbourne, where traditionally it's always sort of been an AFL sort of state. Well, what really happened was they had success early on, so that brought in the crowds. And yeah. people down in Melbourne, they loved their sports, so they had an AFL team and they had a rugby league team, and there was only one team there in Melbourne to support, so it didn't really clash with um, their AFL team. So they, yeah. they picked up two teams. And being able to play in a town where you are a one-team town, and predominantly AFL, that those fans that really do enjoy rugby league, and there's quite a number of them down in, in Melbourne, in all of Victoria, that they would support us through thick and thin. Um, thankfully, we had a, a lot of success while I was down there. But it, you're also isolated, and that sort of played in your favour, that um, the true fans, they weren't too fickle. They didn't drop in and drop out. That if they were there, they were there. Um, yeah. And they, they supported you through thick and thin. So, yeah, it wasn't like a, they had to choose between an AFL or rugby league. They actually picked up two, similar yeah. to what I think the Canadians can do with uh, yeah. Toronto and Ottawa. They can have their ice hockey team, but they've also got now a rugby league team that they're not actually com directly competing with, where probably yeah. in our uh, other states with our soccer, our rugby union, rugby league and AFL, they either have one or the other. But in, in Melbourne, it's terrific. They had an AFL team and they had a, a rugby league team. That's interesting stuff, and I mean, you, you know, you guys made the grand final and a couple of times. And what was it like playing in the grand final? Uh, and what's what's the sort of, like, you know, what, what's the intensity like? The build up to 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 playing in in sort of, you know, a, a massive game. Yeah, well, you know, six we, we lost, and we probably took the occasion. Um, and, and more was overwrought by the occasion and instead of just actually playing the game and then the week leading up to it is a massive week you've got a grand final breakfast you've got all these other engagements um, signing sessions fan days all this sort of stuff that goes along with the occasion and then in 07 we sort of just relaxed a little bit um, literally that's what we did and we just said we're just going to focus on our performance yeah. um, and let the occasion just happen and don't get overwrought by it and just play the game and then we just focus on the game and the output of us we've got the results but um, yeah it's a it's a draining week um, it can be quite taxing emotionally on you as well because you're up and down and you start having um, premonitions and dreams that you're going to hold that trophy aloft and it's only Tuesday um, and the game's yeah, not yeah. until Sunday so so the way you, you've got a good coasting and focus and narrow your thoughts on just your performance day in day out and that, not get overawed by the occasion then you'll be alright yeah, that's really interesting stuff. And, I mean, obviously, you know, last year we, in South of the surprise, you know, package in terms of, uh, you know, I don't think that mind me saying that, you know, basically, I'm sure they sort of must have had some sort of um, belief they could go as far as they did from a personal point of view. I thought that a you know, great achievement. I mean, what did you sort of make of the, the Super League last year? Then um, did you sort of keep an eye on it or what are you sort of thoughts in terms of... 
you... Well, I did. I, I tried to get as much Super League in as I possibly could, but uh, most of the, the football that I'm watching and cutting up is the Brisbane Broncos games. You're, you're pretty flat out and as assistant course, coach yeah. watching um, NRL games, watching our games. But, but um, I haven't seen this... The standard of Super League is still quite exciting. It's very free-flowing. It's more attack-orientated than the NRL, and at times it's really a pleasure to watch. And, and I was um, a fan of the Salford, seeing them playing the, the Super League Grand Final last year. It was terrific for not only just Salford, but for the game over there, yeah. to see other teams start to have a bit of success. And it has been dominated predominantly by Bradford, Leeds, Wigan, and St Helens. I think the only four teams that have won the the, the Super League competition since its inception, I think in 95, yeah. um, and Warrington and Hull have had quite a bit of success in the Challenge Cups realm, but it was just terrific to see an, another team in the grand final, and, and hopefully they can start to build off the back and give other clubs, um, the Hulls, uh, Wakefield, those type of clubs, the, the sort of castle for the well, they ride up there as well, but yeah. um, they can be up there and be at the top of the competition as well. Yeah, that's really interesting stuff, you know, from, from that perspective in terms of, you know, the game, obviously, you know, someone of, of your sort of stature in the game is... Put a lot of lean muscle mass there. That's taxing on the body as it is because that lean muscle mass is their armour. Um, then they're going to be able to do repeat shuttles, so the anaerobic capacity has to be quite high as well. Then they've got to have a good aerobic capacity as well. So I'm a little bit biased, but it's almost a complete athlete conditioning that needs to be done for the rugby league play. Have a look at a few different sports. Um, soccer, very much aerobically based, not a lot of physicality, so there's not a lot of collisions. So they can virtually just be a very much a running athlete, um, yeah. kicks a ball. Uh, tennis, so again, a non-contact sport, short, sharp, interval sprints, high aerobic, but short, sharp rests in between points and in between sets. The rugby league's an ongoing sport that has bursts of high intensity uh, involved with heavy massive collisions uh, as yeah. well so the overall capacity of the athlete has to be able to tick nearly every physicality box endurance uh, and aerobically strength um, muscular physique so it, it's it's something that's um, it's a work in progress and SSC coaches are always trying to fine tune and sports scientists are trying to fine tune the, the best way to, to train these athletes yeah. um, so they can become the best players they can be and so it's a bit of a juggling act at times. Yeah, and I can imagine, obviously, you know, the, the peaking and tapering for games too, you're not actually, you know, you're going into the games uh, in top condition, but also you want to make sure over a season prevent injuries and you know, it must be obviously a challenge to sort of to do that. I mean you've worked in the uh, in the women's game too and we've seen sort of growth in the women's game in the UK recently. Um, uh, you know it's obviously still a long way to go but what was the experience like working in, in the women's game uh, and what what did, you, what did you make of that experience yourself? It was wonderful. You really had to um, use your craft as a coach. Uh, I was doing an interview the other day that a lot of these girls were athletes, they didn't play a lot of rugby league, they played touch football or Oz tag or league tag, they didn't have a lot of the understanding of the intricacies of rugby league itself, um, so they played similar sports but not rugby league themselves, or if they did, they played in under 12s and it had been a few years between um, time that they played, so they were, they were sponges, they just really wanted to listen and learn and and understand why in the, in the rugby league or the Super League and the NRL we did specific things. So why did we get to that part of the field to put on this type of play? Or why do we play man-on-man defence or marker system sort of stuff? These are little things they they did, hadn't really learnt before and uh, yeah. they were always open for, for, to learning and, and um, took it on board really quickly. And something yeah. about with, with just women in general, they're... They're pretty good listeners, uh, and they implement things really well. Um, yeah. But yet, they can they can talk quite a bit as well. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, make yeah. sure when you can write it in, yeah. uh, that they're listening as well. I mean, you know, it's interesting stuff. You know, you say it. in terms of the standard. I know it's hard to compare. You know, standards. There's, there's just no way of comparing. You know, the men's standards to the women's standard. But just generally speaking, from your sort of professional point of view, having played the game at the highest level and, and sort of coached at the highest level, what were you were you impressed by the standard, Ben? Did you think that you know that, that good standard of rugby league? I oh, definitely. And the more and more that they get to play week in week out, and the, the Harvey Norman Premiership over here in Australia, and in the Sydney competition and the respective competition in Queensland, is getting better and better. And more and more of these girls are able to train 
full time and work part time and get a little bit of a wage to play. Um, and I was comparing them apples to apples. I never looked at the women's game and compared it to the men's game. I was just coaching who was in front of me yeah, um, yeah. and how they applied themselves and how they went about the game in respect to who they're playing. And so it's hard. I said to people, I said, well, don't compare it to the men's game because they're Absolutely. women playing against women. Yeah. They're not women playing against men. So just compare it to themselves. And uh, some of the, the games, or well, the three games that I'm involved with in the East they were high quality games. Mm. Um, and some of the games in the women's competition that we saw at international level uh, within the Nines and the Australian and England last year, they were, they were good quality games. And the more wow. that they get to play, not only together, but against each other as well, the game will only grow, grow and grow, and the quality will, will, will increase as well. Yeah, and that's interesting stuff, and, and you know we've seen you know some growth, and and no doubt it'll continue to grow um, the game, and and, and you know so it's a great great sport. Um, it's a fantastic sport, also from a recreational point of view too, in terms of you know keeping in in, in great shape as well. But obviously from a competitive point of view, it sort of goes up a, a, a notch or two. In terms of your own sort of experience, Ben, you sort of you worked obviously at um, at Brisbane Broncos. Well, how would you describe your time there? I mean, it's, it's a you know obviously. A, a prestigious club as a well established rugby league team it's known around the world and we all know about the Broncos but what was your sort of, how would you sort of sum up your time there what was it like working for, for Brisbane yeah, it was terrific it was a terrific opportunity to come here come up here to Brisbane from Newcastle and uh, get my first position in the NRL um, blessed to have a really talented young roster um we had a few older statesmen, Alex Glenn and Darius Boyd, that were leading the way and helping these young guys develop. And they're coming and just see this talent, the young talent of good character of people as well. That was really a pleasurable thing. That these kids were um, had good characters and they were willing to to listen and learn. Um, and it is a one team town as well, and everyone in, in Brisbane loved the Broncos, and the whole state loves the Broncos. So you realise the enormity of when you are coaching the Brisbane Broncos when you turn up to Sun Corp and there's 35,000 wow. um, people, especially with the game against the the Cowboys, uh, the big rival games. That you know that it's a it's a pretty big deal. Um, yeah. You feel very fortunate to be at a club like Brisbane. No stones left unturned regarding resources, terrific facility, um, terrific location to, to train and work. So, um, yeah, I couldn't be happier. The first yeah. opportunity to come to Brisbane Broncos is, is my first role. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. And so, you know, obviously, you know, for our listeners, no doubt there's a lot of listeners who, you know, play the game, certainly, you know, around this part of the UK. And you've got, you know, young listeners listening in thinking, OK. Um, in a lot of early specialisation in sports. And uh, I really still encourage a lot of kids to play multiple sports because there's yeah. a lot of carryover from whether they're playing soccer as well as league or they play cricket or baseball or basketball or something like that. Keep on playing other sports. Like don't pigeonhole yourself just into rugby league initially. You can use other skill sets of other sports that carry over into rugby league as well. And um, if you really want to follow that path towards rugby league, well, have that as your focus, but definitely play other sports and other interests outside of rugby league because you can get all consuming just being focused on that one sport and obviously leads to a lot of injuries as well. But mm. um, yeah, that's probably the biggest takeaway I have from being involved with a lot of junior rugby league, a, a sports high school here that um, play other sports as well. Even yeah. it's just recreational yeah. um, because the carryover is tremendous and, and you can have look, different uh, problem solving ability that you can take from other sports and implement in rugby league and it's a terrific insight into um, multiple facets of different sports. Yeah, that's a great point, and, and no doubt there's plenty of parents listening too, and they'll have heard that. And, and you know, obviously at the moment we're in, at the moment this recording we're in lockdown, and, and there's restrictions. Yeah. But obviously, as as, yeah. and, as and when things ease and that sort of stuff getting back out there, I think that that's a great sentiment in terms of you know parents sort of thinking, should we just play? Whether it's you know whether they're focusing on on soccer, football, rugby league, or rugby union, I think what you've mentioned is really important. The crossover, the transferable skills um, in different sports, whether they sort of you know play basketball basketball, volleyball, just to sort of get that coordination yeah. down is a great point. And your own career yourself, then what would you say your highlights were? I mean, obviously you had a distinguished career. You've played, you know, England, the, the UK, you played at the highest level, you've been in the grand finals. And what would you say would, would be your, your sort of highlight in, in your own career? Oh, most definitely winning the premiership is a highlight. That's, that's something that you 
And it's a whole lot because you get to share it with a lot of really good friends that you work really hard for. Um, yeah, that shared success is terrific. Um, individual success was getting to play State of Origin and represent Australia, um, PNG, and that's that was a bit more of an individual success. But that shared success um, that you, you put in with your teammates week in, week out, with your coaching staff, all the hard work they did, uh, that, that premiership, and that premiership is for all the players that have ever played with as well, from under 14s through to under um, local first grade, coming up through the ranks and reserve grade at Canberra. That was for them as well because they all helped my journey to get to where I, I got to. And um, yeah, so the highlight was definitely yeah. winning the premiership. But I had some big games in the UK as well. Uh, I missed out on the Challenge Cup final with Wigan there with a broken arm, but I got to play in the semi final and spent, uh, we went on the uh, Challenge Cup with uh, Wigan in 2011. That was tremendous to be at Wembley yeah. on the field, clicking wow. the medal and taking a bit of the grass home with me <laughs> yeah, in yeah. Australia. So uh, those opportunities were, were second to none as well. So there's certainly been some truly highlights, but yeah, whenever you get that premiership, um, that's pretty special. Yeah, and I can imagine, and, and you know, these are sort of things that most of us can only sort of dream about. But you know, it's it's, it's great to sort of hear what your experience was like. And in I mean, one of the sort of questions I ask a lot of the the, the guests, uh, you know, some of the toughest performers. I know it's hard to sort of you know single out one or two. No doubt, every 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 team you've played against and player has been you know challenging in their own way. But who would you say in your own career, Ben, was sort of some of the toughest before toughest players to play against? Um, you just have these guys that are just always competitive. Yeah. Um, so guys, especially in my position, you just had guys like uh, Petro Sivnasiva, Shane Webke, um, uh, just guys that were just always competitive, always coming at you. And those two of the guys that personified it the most. Um, yeah. Across the, Adrian, one of your the Englishmen, Adrian Morley, uh, played yeah. quite a bit against here in Australia when he was at the Roosters and also when he was over back in the UK. Yeah. Just always competitive. It's those type of players um, that you play against that you, you just can't take your breath. They're always coming at you. So those three guys sort of are right up there in the position uh, that I had to come up against quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, and that's interesting stuff. And I suppose, I mean, another thing as well too, I think that we you, you could take away from sort of rugby league as well. I, th I think the sort of professionalism, you know, certainly in NRL and and for me, sort of like you know, you mentioned there playing international rugby league. And one thing that's always struck me about the Australian team is the level of professionalism that they take no team lightly. You mentioned PN, you know, PNG there, and we, we saw them get a result against um, England not long ago. And it just sort of goes to show that on the day, you know, going to be anybody. But is that something that sort of instilled? from an early age then that sort of professionalism not to take anyone lightly you go out then and you give 100% no matter who you play and full respect to the opposition I think that just comes from the, uh, the junior development pathways here in the NRL um, everyone's always fighting for a position and there's yeah. only so many positions there's only 17 each week in the NRL so we try to create an always competitive environment to um, to be always competitive so if you're not fighting for your position, uh, then if you're not fighting to, to to win the game on the weekend as well, you always just got to be competing. Um, and that, that, that's something that ever over in the UK as well with, with their Super League clubs. And uh, yeah. if you can create an opportunity or environment where you're always competing for positions, and that was one of the biggest things where clubs have success. They have a lot of players always competing for positions. At Melbourne Storm, we had quite a number of quality players um, all looking to play in the same position. So that's only you bring out the better in yourself when you have a look at a lot of the, the good, successful clubs. Yeah. And they will have quite a number of good players for that same position. So the best player only going gets the position. So you want to perform well on the weekend to keep the position. And I heard someone once say that um, every game is only a, a job interview for next week next weekend's game and sort of yeah. if you look at it like that that uh, your performance on the weekend uh, keeps you in position for the next week well then so be it so make sure you put your best foot forward every weekend yeah. um, so that competitive environment always be competing for your position if you're competing for your position you'll compete for the game to, to get the result 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really powerful insight, that, uh, Ben. I think that, you know, what you've mentioned there is something that you can transfer pretty much to, to life in general, you know, the, the interview for, for the next, I mean, that's sort of, you know, whatever, whatever job we're in, really, I think that's, that's a great sort of sentiment. You can see that sort of transferable skill. I think sport transfers a lot of skills to, to life in general, and, you know, that, that I think is, is, is a powerful way, you know, for any sort of young athlete listening or someone in business listening or anyone in, you know, teaching role thinking, okay, well, you know, there's no room for complacency you know going forward I mean in your own career obviously you sort of played at the highest level as a player you've, you've coached you've got the experience of sort of co uh, coaching at, at a high level um, where do you sort of see yourself now uh, Ben what's you know going forward I mean do you have any, any sort of insights into what you think you, you might sort of do or I'm def definitely earmarking sort of tracking uh, plan is to be a head coach one day in the NRL yeah. how uh, I'm going to get there how about, I still don't know the path hasn't been laid out for me or, um, and there's plenty of different paths to sort of get to that destination um, I'm trying to do as much as I possibly can to develop myself as, as much as I possibly can in not only the world of coaching but in leadership and mentoring as mm -hmm. well so looking outside the square a little bit I'm doing a, a business uh, advanced diploma of leadership management that I know will have crossover skills in the sports coaching not only in business so just looking at different ways to be able to better myself as a person to to be the best possible coach I can be for my players and and always be a um a player coach first um sort mm -hmm. of person and, and whether where that will take me I don't know um mm -hmm. will it take me to the UK have a coaching opportunity over there or another NRL club I'm not sure or coach the Queensland Cup team or, or what I'm, I'm not sure too sure at the moment but um, that's that's the final destination where mm -hmm. I want to get to initially um, and then just sort of put out a blueprint how to get there and, and just working really hard and, and, and being a good person, good character of a person and making good connections and building mm -hmm. relationships with people in the game is, is sort of how you have to go about doing that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, obviously you've got the experience and you've got a lot to offer, uh, you know, team and coaching, that's for sure. I think that, you know, obviously I think the, the experience of sort of working in, in sort of Australia and the UK and sort of coaching and playing at the highest level um, is formidable. But it's been great speaking to you. I'm sure our listeners have really enjoyed, uh, you know, hearing your perspective of playing in NRL and, and in the UK as well. Ben, it's been great to, to speak to you on, on the show. We really want to thank you and we wish you every success, uh, you know, going forward in your career and you know, who knows? We might sort of see you playing and oh, well, coaching it anyway in the UK again at some time. Um, if otherwise, we sort of wish you all the, all the best uh, and thanks for joining us on the show. Oh, no, thank you, Jimmy, for having me. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much and uh, thank you to all your wonderful listeners as well. Great stuff. That was Ben Cross, uh, rugby league player who's played at the highest level, who's played in the UK as well for the likes of you know Wigan Warriors and and, and, and Witness and Leeds, and he's played at the highest level for the likes of Melbourne Storm in Australia and, and coached as well um, for the Brisbane Broncos and assistant too. Great to join us on 94.4 FM, South of City Radio, Friday Sports Show, your host, Jim Petruzzi. Um, until next week, thanks for listening, and 94.4 is your dial.